<laughs> okay. I pushed the record button, so it's time to get back, I guess. If you think, if you think that the great debate of science versus religion that went on back in the days of Copernicus are over, think again. In fact, today the great debate is about progress. So I've invited a few friends back to talk with us about progress for the moment. Science has led us down the wrong path. The scientific discoveries are increasing carbon, destroying the planet with chemicals and non-natural substances. Reverend Eco. I understand, oh shoot, I'm on the wrong side here. The mad scientist should be on this side, Reverend Nico should be on this side. Anyway, you, you, you should know the difference anyway. Sorry about that. Um, Reverend Nico, I understand your concerns. But science has brought us progress, innovation, to make our lives better. We are living longer because of scientific advances with more conveniences and luxury. We are so much better off with science. You are wrong, mad scientist! Sorry, don't worry. <laughs> You're too far to the edge there. Man is being consumed by this machine of progress, chewed up and spat out with no regard for values, dignity, or happiness. Poison, disguise, dis poison disguised as progress shows the vulgarity of your values. A lot of words can make sense. Reverend Eco. Clearly you cannot say that all of the medical cures, advancements in farming, telecommunications, all of these things are not bad things. Do you have a cell phone, Reverend Eco? Do you use the internet? Someone's cell phone's ringing! <laughs> Sorry, that's wrong. <laughs> Why does it always happen I'm in character? Someone's got a cell phone that rings. I don't get it. Okay. Do you use the internet, Reverend Eco? Do you fly in airplanes? Are these bad things? Shame on you! You create false needs. Life was so much better before cell phones. Before that sense that we needed all these little gadgets, all these little tiny things that we have in our pockets that make us that we cannot relax. We cannot rest from our work. We cannot get away. Gone! Gone is a simple life of face-to-face -face conversation and these gadgets. They destroy our dignity. They destroy our self-worth. We're nothing now, but we're tied to these terrible things. Reverend Eco, you can just turn off your phone. Engage with your followers face to face. Don't blame the technology for your own personal weakness. And what if you need to contact someone in an emergency? What would you do then? Evil! You try to catch us with your gadgets, turning wants into needs and a must haves. You become the handmaidens to Satan evil industry. You use, they, they use you to make profits, to fill our lives with things we don't need, dumping poisons on us. That may seem a bit extreme, Reverend Eco. Sure, we work with industry, and also with governments, because industry is able to fund our research. Look how we're able to fund research in the fight against the global war on climate. We're fighting global warming. Surely that's a good thing. LIARS! How can we trust you? You destroy the planet, and then you try to convince us that with you in industry, you're trying the only ones who can save it. Sodom and Gomorrah, you in industry, that's what you become. The only ones that can save us? I don't think so. You give us more gadgets to send in more of our money to save the planet. You're selling us more things, not less. We can't trust you, and you think we have no option? We can go back to simpler times. I don't think people want to go back to living in caves and hunting for berries. Progress is here to stay, Reverend. It may not be perfect, but we're working on it. Hand in hand with government and industry, science is solving the problems, protecting man from the ravages of nature. Philistine! Nature is not a threat! 
It is a poor victim to your torturous savagery. Science should be green to move back to nature, not to destroy nature. Pity the poor polar bear. What has he ever done to you? <coughs> I'm sorry, Reverend Nico, but we don't share the same language or the same worldview. I think, quite frankly, that you're talking nonsense, and I really don't have time to bother with you anymore. Just leave me alone. I have so much more important work to do than to deal with you. So you just ignore them. Oh, Heretic! Your world is not the future, it's the past. If we cannot work with you instead, we'll block you. Any innovations you have, GMOs, nanotech, we'll block them, we'll block your funding. Soon you'll see that the only funds available are for green science. You'll know who has real power, and it's us. It's you. Come back here, come back here, mad scientist. Where are you going? I'm not done with you yet. Okay. This debate is probably more stronger today than it was in the Enlightenment. When you generally have this double sense. In the Enlightenment, you had the sense of progress, of society moving forward. And, well, you, know, you get this Hegelian push in a certain sense of action-reaction, so the Romanticism came about as a reaction against this progress. Well, we see this today. Um, and I, I think it's rather interesting to see at what point progress became a poison. And if we look at science developed in the 1400s, we go back to Francis Bacon, science was really at that point the way that man could solve the problems. And the main problem that man had was nature. Nature was destroying man. Now, if you look at Hobbes, you know, life was cold, nasty, brutish, and short. And that sense of you know, pest, you know, pestilence, diseases, plagues, natural disasters, man was extremely vulnerable. And science from the 1400s on was made to protect man from the evils of nature. At a certain point, and I think it was post-war, but in the 1950s, we no longer had that imminent threat that science needed to protect us from. And so science was no longer seen so much as protecting man, but creating these modern conveniences. The modern, the modern expansion in the 1950s of things like your um, refrigerators, cars, all these wonderful things. It's no longer protecting man from nature, no longer curing diseases. Science was seen to work with industry to create conveniences. Things like this that are going to give us cancers. Okay. Foods that we're, we're eating that we're not sure about. So there were different things coming out of science that was no longer the justification to protect man. There still was that sense of science being there to save humanity when AIDS came as a main disease. Yesterday was AIDS day. Uh, people looked at science to please help us, save us. And so the pharmaceutical industry began to look for a cure for AIDS. So we still have that sense when nature comes in and threatens us. Okay, when we, when we were afraid, for example, of swine flu, and the, you know, millions of people who could die from swine flu, we all looked for a vaccine. We all looked to science to save us. But that view is very rare today. Generally, the view of nature is not some evil, cruel thing that's going to kill us. Rather, it's the other way around now. Nature, nature is this poor polar bear on an iceberg that we're destroying through our own attacks on nature. So nature's the victim, and man now is the aggressor. Okay, so we, we, we've seen the debate shift in this case. And I think that that's the point. Is it progress or is it destruction? And this happened when science started to work with industry to create these conveniences, these fridges, these cars, these, these things that we didn't actually need to defend ourselves against nature. So the, 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 by aligning with industry, science has changed a little bit. And I think that that's, that's probably where we, many people feel, have surpassed the boundaries. Science, is it about discovery? Is it about protecting man? Or is it about selling us an iPhone 4S? Okay. With four uh, transmitters, which will give us cancer much faster. So there's, there is that element here of science being involved with innovation, and innovation bringing uncertainty. And that new sort of romanticism that's coming out in the environmental movement is expressing that. Science has gone too far. 
Now, <clears throat> this is an interesting debate because um, industry, of course, continues to market these wants, continues to try to you know, deliver these luxuries or conveniences. But many people are feeling a certain loss of meaning of li in life. They no longer have a chance to enjoy things the same. They can't take a holiday anymore. People didn't come into their office today, but they're still at home working now. You know, so that there's that feeling of a reluctance to some of these wonderful advances that we've made. And I think that's a real hard question for science to look at because we're creating risks to a certain degree. And I have a certain, <coughs> sorry to say that I need to get some water. I have some sympathy for my friend Reverend Eco, who feels that science is, science is going too far. So what do we do? Do we go back? Do we go back to the old days? Do we get rid of cell phones? Do we get rid of the internet? Do we get rid of a lot of these new chemicals which you know, allow us to put water in a bottle that we can transport? We have no water in this room. Where would I get my water from if I couldn't put it in plastic? So we have to, we, do, we, do we go back then? Do we change somehow? Can we go back? And this is the debate today. And industry is, of course, in this debate because industry has made lots of investments. Some people say we don't have public water anymore because industry wants to sell us this. One thing I think is that people are generally wired differently. This goes back to the question of trust. Some people are interested in change. They like new things. I have two, two daughters who like new things. I've got a son who hates an, anything new. I didn't raise them differently. It's just wired differently. Uh, so people want to solve problems. Other people find that those problems themselves shouldn't be there. They run away from it. We want to go back to simpler times. I uh, had the good fortune of being the rapporteur to write a report for the European Union Research Advisory Board, where we interviewed scientists and tried to get scientists in the room with uh, NGO activists, uh, environmentalists. And we had to find a way to get scientists and activists, like the mad scientist, and I'm not joking, they really were like this, the mad scientist on one hand and Reverend Eco on the other. And we had, I had a year to keep bringing them together to try to give some advice to the European Union, and you can get this report here. It wasn't a successful report. The conclusions are that the mad scientist and Reverend Eco will never get along. <laughs> but we had to find ways, because the European Commission's trying to fund you know, a certain cross-fertilization between them. Okay. So science itself is dealing with this debate. And of course, scientific information has always been uh, considered neutral. The man in the white coat comes in as the expert and makes the decision. His <coughs> views are objective, they're scientific, they're credible. And that, that view has been a good trust-building tool for industry. If you can get your scientists to say this is safe, the people will trust you. If the company says this is safe, well, you're making money. Of course you're going to say it's safe. We don't trust you. Well, today, though, unfortunately, because of the internet and the ability to communicate, anybody can put on a white coat. If I have a BSc, a Bachelor in Science, I can say something completely different from an expert in the field. So it begins to be our scientists versus their scientists. Scientists are themselves being pulled in to a political debate. Look at climate change. Okay. A large group of scientists are saying that the world is warming and we're in trouble. There's another group that is saying, well, no, the world's not warming. You can't predict these. These models are not, you know, this is not science what you're doing. You're doing politics. You're not doing science. Of course, they're also working with industry, um, particularly in this case on, on <coughs> corporate issues. Uh, ExxonMobil got their fingers burnt because they were involved in this debate. So there are also scientists who are against lobbyists, against globalization, against industry. Scientists themselves are becoming political. So we're beginning to find trust evaporating. So industry is having a hard time now working in that case. Okay, we're going to move to crisis communication now, but just want to say a few words about your exam as well. Okay, so the first part of your exam, 